So the, the whole goal of the root cause protocol is to help people become aware of the fact that under acute and chronic stress, we're constantly losing minerals. And when we lose the, the key minerals, magnesium and copper, magnesium to acute stress, copper to chronic stress, we lose the ability to make energy. And when we can't make energy, we can't respond to stress. The best definition that I know of about the, the stress energy connection is by Mark Hyman. He's a famous um, mm -hmm. functional physician, as you know, at Cleveland Clinic. Stress is the body's inability to make energy for the mind to respond to its environment. Welcome back to Reconditioned with me, Lauren Vaknin. A bit bunged up today, in case you can't hear, so I'm prefacing that right away. I've had a head cold all week. I was interviewed on a podcast uh, where I spent the entire interview blowing my nose, so <laughs> that's going to be a fun one. This one, I am at the tail end of it, and luckily for me, Morley agreed to postpone by a day, which was great. Um, this episode was so good... I laughed with Morley Robbins um, at the beginning that, or at the end actually, that I told my friend Kate that I was going to be recording this and with him and she said, oh my god, that's so exciting and we both laughed because of the things that we find exciting but if you're here and you're listening to this, I'm guessing you're my spirit animal, you're going to find this exciting as well. So Morley Robbins is such a pioneer and <clears throat> he has such knowledge on the human body. And um, he is a mineral expert, but really what that means is, uh, from what you'll get from the episode that we spoke about today, is just how much these mineral imbalances are affecting absolutely every aspect of our lives. Every illness can be um, healed by having the right mineral balance. We can help our anxiety, ADHD, depression, everything, thyroid, pregnancy issues, fertility, and it comes down to the fact that we are have too much iron, we have iron toxicity because we're being told that we need to supplement with iron, where in fact we don't at all, we are iron toxic, and we don't have enough copper or magnesium. And I started doing Morley's uh, root cause protocol about five, six years ago, and it really is awesome. And actually, this has inspired me to really get back onto it very strict. I mean, I've always kept the principles, um, but this has inspired me to really get onto it. So a few things to mention. You might have a lot of questions at the end of this. After the call, Morley uh, very kindly and generously offered to do a QA and a uh, episode. So if you do have questions in relation to this episode, because it is quite complex and there may be questions, send them through to support at laurenvacneen.co.uk and just put um, Morley Q&A in the subject box if you don't mind, um, because there's going to be so many questions that come up from this, because it, it, some of it's quite scientific and complex, but if you suffer from pretty much anything at all, you're going to want to listen to this. Um, it really was such an expansive episode talking about every type of magnesium we could get hold of, which ones we need, how to do it with diet, why we need copper more than pretty much anything, where to get copper from, what iron is doing to us, what our iron toxicities are doing to us, where it's coming from that's making us so sick, and so many other things, children, pregnancy, everything you can imagine. All the links will be, as usual, in the show notes. So if you're listening and you're wondering, just go to the show notes, the link for the Root Cause Protocol, the Root Cause Protocol Facebook group and the Magnesium Advocacy group, as well as the link for where to get the Recuperate Copper Supplement that Morley spoke about in the episode. Anything else that I haven't covered, like I said, please email me at support at laurenvacneen.co.uk and we will do a little Q&A episode for all those answers and I'm so looking forward to that because for me this really was an exciting, informative, expansive episode that's just taught me so much more about mineral balance and why that's so important for literally 
every aspect of our lives. So thank you for being here as usual. You know I appreciate you all and I appreciate every single person that listens to this. And um, stay tuned for the Q&A and stay tuned for the next episode and enjoy this episode with Morley Robbins. You're going to want to take notes. Fun fact. Humans take in more information in one day now than they did in their entire lives in the 1700s. No wonder we're overwhelmed. Our brains and bodies simply haven't evolved to manage this level of stress. And until that evolution happens, if we want to be well in mind and body, we need things that help alleviate this stress. For me, one of the key tools in my daily wellness toolkit that does this is the Sensate. And if you've been here a while, you'll know how genuinely obsessed I am with this product. It is a piece of health tech that fits in the palm of your hand, and it basically sends infrasonic waves through the chest to activate the vagus nerve and calm the autonomic nervous system while you listen to the specially composed audio within the app. I usually use the Sensate for 10 to 20 minutes before I sleep to reduce cortisol levels, calm my brainwave states from the hectic day, and send me into a deep sleep. Clients of friends of mine who have a Sensate have told me that their sleep has never been so good. People who usually struggle with sleep just wake up in the same position they went to sleep in. Everyone needs a Sensate in my opinion, and I particularly recommend it to anyone who suffers from overwhelm or anxiety, and anyone who wants to deepen their meditation practice. And you can get 30 pounds off the Sensate by visiting getsensate.com and using code Lauren30. That's G-E-T-S-E-N-S-A-T-E dot com, Lauren30. Thank you so much to Sensate for supporting our mission here at Reconditioned. Morley Robbins is a retired hospital executive and healthcare consultant who went on to become a self-taught mineral expert and creator of the Root Cause Protocol and became known around the world as the Magnesium Man. His impressive body of work and research focuses on the profound metabolic interplay between three key minerals, magnesium, bioavailable copper, and iron. I personally started the Root Cause Protocol about five or six years ago and have wanted to have Morley on the show since it started. So huge welcome to you. Well, thank you. I'm I'm sorry it's taken us five years to get to this point, but that's okay. Now we're ready ready for each other. (laughs) Absolutely. Things happen when they're meant to happen. I don't know why it's taken um, five years, really, but I'm happy to have you here. Maybe, Maybe it was for me to really delve into your knowledge more and have a deeper understanding. But before we kind of crack on with it, well, the first first things first, first thing I always do is ask my guests, what have you done so far today to support your wellness? <laughs> well, I've had my my uh, daily intake of coffee to make sure that I'm awake. Uh, I've had my daily reflection to make sure that I'm in, in connection. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've done at my level best to stimulate my neurons to make sure that I'm um, still connecting the dots properly, but I'm also ready for this conversation. So that's a really that, nice answer. Yeah, that helps me when I when I know that my neurons are firing, then I know I can relax in the conversation. It's like it just takes some of the stress away. Absolutely. And I'm actually really excited to delve into that with you and into all the minerals and the things we should be doing that actually aid our cognitive function. Before we do it, um, I'd love for you to take us through kind of your background and how you came to be doing what you're doing now to give some context to it. Um, Born into a very sickly family. Uh, Mom was an alcoholic who had a lot of heart attacks and a stroke. And uh, dad was um, manic depressive with schizophrenia. And um, my sister became a nurse. My older sister, four years older, became a nurse. So I was supposed to become the doctor. And uh, when I got to um, college, uh, that was not in the cards. That was a lot more work than I realized and didn't exactly turn the academic scene on fire with my performance. 
Um, I went ahead and applied, but didn't get in. Um, and if you can't become a doctor, you become a hospital executive. And that's what, what I did. Because if you can't be a doctor, you boss them around. And I did that for 32 years as, a, as an executive for 12 and as a consultant for 20. Um, knew that there was something wrong with the system. It wasn't solving the problem and didn't really understand it uh, until I left the industry, uh, developed what's called a frozen shoulder from pulling a suitcase behind my back for 20 years, which got me to my now wife, who is a chiropractor. And she introduced me to the phrase innate healing. I'd never heard that word in 32 years of working in the hospital. And I thought to myself in that very first uh, encounter with Dr. Liz, didn't say anything to her, but I thought, if there's an innate healer, why do we have millions of doctors around the world? And that, that didn't make sense to me. So I set out on a quest to discover who is this innate healer. And, and that's really what, what the book is about. Cure Your Fatigue is to profile who is the innate healer inside our body. And of course, I've highlighted the symbol for copper because most people have been trained like circus bears to believe that copper is toxic. And what I've come to realize just in the last few months is that copper is toxic to big pharma profit. Mm -hmm. And it is the most overlooked, misunderstood, um, catalytic agent in our body that if you really understood what it does, you'd be running down the streets like your hair was on fire. And so we live in this very funny world where we're, we're taught to believe that we are anemic and we are copper toxic. And because of that, we think nothing of taking iron supplements and iron infusions, which is basically metabolic poison to our body and our mitochondria. And we shun the very nutrient, the very mineral that regulates both oxygen and iron, which are incredibly toxic when they are put together and copper can regulate both of them at the same time and allow us to make energy all the while. So it's just, it, it's almost laughable how wrong uh, the system has it about copper and how confused we are about what I would say is hands down the most important mineral on the planet. So I was under the impression until maybe a few months ago when I listened to another podcast you did, that kind of magnesium was your, because you were known as the magnesium thing. Your your Facebook group is the magnesium yep. advocacy group. So are you, do you, are they both equally as important as each other, copper and magnesium? Great or question. does one have more? I mean, it's always nuanced, isn't it? To say Absolutely. something is more important than something else is kind of silly. But um, was your first introduction to this work that you do now, which you have read, studied, produced material on extensively, was your introduction to that with magnesium or with copper? No, it's a great, great question. It's like asking who's more important, your mom or your dad. Right. right. <laughs> you need both, yeah. You need both. Um, I was very focused on magnesium when I cut my teeth on this work. I think any, anyone who's followed my work knows that. Um, I was very in, very much influenced uh, by Carolyn Dean's book, uh, The Magnesium Miracle. made so much sense because having worked in hospitals, in and around hospitals for 30 years, I could, as soon as I read her book, I went, oh my gosh, everyone's magnesium deficient. We need more magnesium. And it's just like, it's like a knee jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. And one of very early on, a uh, practitioner said, Morley, if it was just magnesium, we would have figured that out. And in my arrogance, in my in, um, absolute ignorance, I said, well, you don't understand the way I do. Well, it turns out, I was wrong, and that practitioner was right, but it took me about five, almost seven, actually, maybe closer to seven years before I really understood that 
why is magnesium being lost? It's being lost to stress. That's well documented. Uh, Mildred Seelig was the world's authority on on magnesium status and magnesium deficiency, and she always came back to the stress induced loss of magnesium. She, you know, there's thousands of forms of stress, but there's only four classical types of stress. There's physical stress, there's environmental stress, there's psychological stress, and there's metabolic stress. But what's playing in the center of all of that stress is oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. And when oxygen can't be activated and become water inside our mitochondria to release the energy proteins, then that oxygen becomes what's called an oxidant, an accident with oxygen, or it's also called reactive oxygen species. And those uh, reactive species of oxygen burn up magnesium like that very quickly. And what I came to realize was that the magnesium loss was triggered by poorly activated oxygen because there was too much iron. And then I backed into who's keeping track of oxygen and iron? It's copper. And so the whole goal here, I, you know, I have a, a um, diagram behind me with a big triangle, as you can see. And it's actually a, depicting uh, Egyptian healing. It's a beautiful uh, print. And what you can't see are the onks that line the, uh, the, the print. And what you may not know is that onks are made of brass, not gold, and brass is dominated by copper, and the Egyptians knew how important copper was. But but the reason why I have this diagram there is that I want people to know that at the top of the pyramid of minerals is copper, and then right ne next to it are magnesium and iron, and they're in a constant battle with oxygen. And people just need to understand that. And so, again, we're back to arguing about mom and dad, you know, who's more important. And under certain conditions, one is more important than others. But copper, I think, stands above all because of its role to create energy, clear exhaust, and, you know, enable the connections of our connective tissue. It colors everything. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely mind blowing. And what magnesium does is it, when it's in adequate supply, it lowers the chance for oxidative stress. But what, uh, and you can take magnesium all day long and not correct the copper iron dysregulation. And that's why you need to address the copper issue straight on to then prevent the loss of magnesium and prevent the acting out of iron. That, that's the part that I think is so important to get that sense of, interplay between those key minerals. So two questions have arisen from that. Number one, if we're losing magnesium, is the problem that we're losing magnesium or that we're not getting enough of it because our soil is so depleted in minerals or is it both? And the second question is then, can can you talk us through how to regulate copper? Because do you know what? Let's go with the first question first and then we'll do the second yeah. question. Yeah, it is both. We, we we live on a planet where the food looks the same as our ancestors, but it's basically Swiss cheese inside. It just doesn't have the nutrient content that uh, our ancestors grew up with. So there's there's no question there is a loss of minerals in the in the food supply. And then we add insult to injury by refining food which only intensifies the loss of nutrients. And then we have uh, yet another assault from the pharmaceutical system where many of the medications that they make cause magnesium loss and copper loss. Mm -hmm. It's like, really? And so um, the supply of magnesium is down and the loss of magnesium is up because who doesn't have stress in their life? Whose stress level isn't greater today than it was in 2019, right? And we've all endured, you know, a, a global dynamic that we're all still kind of thinking about, 
in our subconscious, we haven't really let down our guard yet. Uh, we're expecting another shoe to drop. Who knows what's going to happen? So we're constantly on edge now. And that causes a relentless loss of magnesium, which makes us more prone to oxidative stress, which then makes us more prone to the problems of low energy. Because again, if we're not activating oxygen to make energy, we're going to create exhaust. And that exhaust would be reactive oxygen species. So the, the whole goal of the root cause protocol is to help people become aware of the fact that under acute and chronic stress, we're constantly losing minerals. And when we lose the, the key minerals, magnesium and copper, magnesium to acute stress, copper to chronic stress, we lose the ability to make energy. And when we can't make energy, we can't respond to stress. The best definition that I know of about the, the stress energy connection is by Mark Hyman. He's a famous um, mm -hmm. functional physician, as you know, at Cleveland Clinic. Stress is the body's inability to make energy for the mind to respond to its environment. And what happened in 2020 is everyone went into a chronic state of stress. And the global loss of magnesium and copper is unrelenting. And it was only intensified by steps that people were taking to try to avoid what was happening. And I knew within a nanosecond that the nutrients that were being taken was going to make copper even less available, which only intensified the stress, the oxidative stress that was building in our body. So it's just, for, for better or for worse, I have um, studied these key minerals very closely and what their me metabolic impact is. And I'm able to um, really zero in on where the breakdown is in human metabolism and the immune system. And so it's it's just a, a unique vantage point that I have that is easily taught. And what, what I find entertaining, Lauren, is that um, I can I can teach this these concepts to uh, the public in about five minutes. It takes me about five months to convince practitioners that I'm right. Yeah. Because there, because there's so many layers of of training and dogma that they've got that they've got to penetrate all of that training, and the mistake that's made, you know, innocent, sincere, but the mistake that they've made is to confuse their training with the truth, mm -hmm. and they're not the same. And the one of the greatest um, characteristics of medical education is that there's two sides. To medical education there's a research side and then there's a clinical side do you think they talk to each other no not at all there's a chinese wall between those two and what i think was one of my great surprises when i first started this work was i grew up thinking that all doctors were like marcus welby you know very compassionate which they are but I also pictured that these Marcus Welby uh, practitioners spent whatever free time they had in the library reading and researching, and they don't. And that was that was a real wake-up call for me. And it's not a criticism of them as practitioners. It's just the reality of their life. They have so little time beyond um, caring for their patients. And then what little time they have, they try to be with either themselves or their family or whatever. And this um, creation of physician as um, repository of clinical intelligence, of all clinical intelligence, is not true. That they, they have been trained very carefully. And I think their training is very scripted. Why? Because there's never any mention of copper other than that it's toxic. There's no mention of um, how copper regulates oxygen. 
There's no mention of the PAM enzyme. You may may or may not know of that. It's, it's a critical enzyme that activates thousands of hormones in our body. And and how do hormones work? Just like our cell phones, they got to be turned on. If they're not turned on, they don't work. And the the enzyme, the, the, the critical enzyme to turn on these hormones is activated by copper. So if you don't have enough copper in your diet, you're not going to have proper regulation, not proper signaling between the hormones. And they're constantly talking to each other. Hey, you need a little help? Can you support? Can I tone it down? Can I bring it up? What can I do? And if they can't communicate these these incredibly sentient chemicals, they're like wearing earmuffs and they've got tape over their mouth and they can't talk to each other. And people wonder why everyone needs hormone replacement therapy. And it's because we're stress cadets and we're stress cadets because we have so little magnesium and copper. So would you say then that a lot of the anxiety, depression, symptoms of ADHD, many of these things can be regulated with the right mineral balance. Absolutely. I mean, the the first thing you want to do is bring iron into regulation. People don't realize how much exposure we have to iron, uh, especially in the UK, in Canada, and the United States, and the third world countries that we support. And it's it's a staggering level of iron that's being added to the food system. And it started when? 1941, in the, in the midst of the Second World War, when um, everyone was in a state of terror. And what is, what do iron, fi- we're not talking about organic iron, we're talking about iron filings. What, what do they do? That's, that's like a toxin to the body. And it sets adrenaline into orbit because it's a threat. It's, you know, we've been trained to think, oh, that little iron is just carrying oxygen, nothing to worry about. It's like, are you kidding? <laughs> 70% of the iron in our body is, is in hemoglobin. Another 10% is in myoglobin. So 80% of the iron in our body is carrying oxygen. And we're adding more iron in the food system. And then we're going through this harangue in testing to tell everyone that they're iron anemic because practitioners are not taught that low iron on a blood test is actually signaling that there's high iron in the tissue. And we've known that since 2004 with uh, Ames and Kalilia. And so um, total confusion about the iron situation. And when iron builds, it's going to disrupt signaling, but it's really going to disrupt uh, the expression of copper. And that's the work of Jamie Collins at the University of Florida in Gainesville, 2016, 2018, 2020. He was able to prove that taking rodents and feeding them iron as an adult human would have, the same level, scaling it back, that that level of iron suppressed copper metabolism. Well, that that's going to affect energy production. It's going to affect hormone signaling. It's going to affect every facet of how copper um, carries out its mission in our body. And is it is it correctable? Absolutely. But what do you have to start with? You got to throw out all of your knowledge, your conventional knowledge, that we're all anemic and copper toxic. And that's a, that's a big step for a lot of people. Again, the, the public is willing to do it pretty quickly. Practitioners are very slow to make that change because then it says, well, then my training was wrong. I spent a lot of money on my training. I've, I sacrificed a lot to get this degree that I've got. And the, the public isn't aware of the inherent conflict that the practitioner is faced with, with a very disruptive model like mine, which says, um, copper is really at the center and iron is a, a completely misunderstood. It's a very threatening model that stirs the soul of a lot of people around the planet. So it's just, a, it's a very, it's a, it's a conflict, not only in our physiology, 
it's a conflict in our uh, soul and our and our whole psychology of being. So let's talk about iron then, because this is something I learned through um, your protocol that mm-hmm. don't take iron supplements is the first thing. Um, they're toxic and. And one of the things that I learned through doing the root cause protocol, which I hadn't heard of before that was um, we're not actually deficient in iron and we don't need iron supplements. So can you talk us through, I know you've obviously just spoken about kind of the background of it, but can you talk us through what that means for our bodies and how we make sure that we are getting the right balance? Yeah, it's a great, very important area to, to understand. Um, so we've been chatting now for about 20 minutes and every second of every day, we have to break down two and a half million red blood cells in our spleen every second, two and a half million red blood cells. And in corresponding fashion, we have to make two and a half million red blood cells in our bone marrow, found in the long bones of our body. What's important for people to know is that 47% of the copper in our body hangs out in the bone marrow of our long bones. And that's where the where the red blood cells are being made. And it can't be done without copper. Again, that's not taught in doctor school, but that's the, the cold, hard reality of it can't make heme, can't make hemoglobin, can't make red blood cells, can't. It's just, it's like, it's so foundational that I probably would teach that on the first day of school if I was running a a program. But the um, breakdown in the spleen is really, really important. And so in the course of 24 hours, we're breaking down 2 trillion red blood cells. Well, we can't even relate to that. It's such a, such a big number. We don't even know what to do with it. But what will surprise the listeners is to find out that it only takes 25 milligrams of iron to support the production of 2 trillion red blood cells. But what will shock people is when they find out that 24 of those 25 milligrams, 95% of the iron, of the daily iron requirement, 95% comes at the courtesy and the regulation of bioavailable copper. Let's put it into context. If you take a nutrient capsule, that holds about 1,000 milligrams of a nutrient. One-tenth of that, one-tenth of that, is the amount of copper in our body, about 100 milligrams, and we find out that 47 are hanging out in the bone marrow. Another another 27% is in our muscles. Oh, with that myoglobin thing, right? And then we find out that 25 milligrams is in our organs, like our spleen. And then we find that 1% of copper is in the blood. And what what they do is they fixate on the 1% and ignore the 99%. So we've got 100 milligrams of copper. And technically, we have five capsules of iron in our body, 5,000 milligrams of iron. So we have 100 milligrams of copper running five milligrams of iron. And in traditional Chinese medicine, copper is the general and iron is the foot soldier. Now, you don't have to be in the military to know that generals are more important than, than foot soldiers. Generals have more stars, more brass. What's brass made out of? Copper, ding, ding, ding. And so the, the general is running the show. And <clears throat> this process of recycling is happening 24 seven all day long. And so we have this minuscule amount, 25 milligrams of iron out of 5,000 milligrams. 25 is what's supporting hemoglobin requirements, which is 70% of the iron in our body. 25 milligrams 
is all we really need. And 24 of it is being recycled constantly. And so we have been led to believe we need constant replacement of iron when in fact the wisdom of our body is designed to make sure that all we really need every day is one milligram of iron. And there are people who are easily being exposed to 25 to 75 milligrams of iron. And if they get an infusion of iron, they're getting 250 milligrams of iron. And where is that iron going when they get an infusion? It's going straight to their liver and their spleen. And what I'm really honing in on, Lauren, in just the last few days, last within the last week, is the role that the spleen plays in all of this dynamic. And I never really stopped to appreciate how critical that organ is to our overall health and well-being. And I've always thought it, spleen was tiny and it was just kind of doing its thing. Well, truth be known, the spleen's size is 80% of the liver. So it's a, it's a much bigger organ than I realized. It's called the mysterious organ. And it has been called that for since Hippocrates' time in uh, 400 BC. So it, it's an interesting trend that, that no one seems to understand this organ. And then I learned some very important things this morning that in anticipation of this conversation, that the presence of adrenaline and or noradrenaline and the nor means no R group, no methyl group. It's been taken off. It has, it's still a sympathetic chemical, but it has different properties. But the presence of adrenaline, of constant chronic adrenaline, that can't be turned off. And how do you turn off adrenaline? You have to have chemicals called phenolases. And, and guess what? They're copper dependent. Ding, ding, ding. So <clears throat> if the adrenaline can't be turned off, it stimulates the liver to make a protein called hepcidin. Most people have never heard of it. Most practitioners have never heard of it. And what does hepcidin do? It triggers iron accumulation in the spleen. And why is that important? Because the spleen is the cross-section of two of the most important functions in the body. Iron recycling, going this way, and immune function going this way. It's like, picture two massive highways intersecting. There's no clover leaves that I know of, and they're just like, boom. And if you start to prevent turning off the adrenaline, the iron is going to accumulate, it's going to build in the liver, in, excuse me, in the spleen, and that's going to compromise our innate and adaptive immune systems that are run by the spleen. It's it's absolutely humbling to realize that it doesn't take a lot of levers to make us more vulnerable to the design of the, the food system. And what we're being exposed to is low nutrient dense food. And we're being exposed to farming chemicals and like glyphosate and uh, food substances like fructose, high fructose corn syrup, that are known toxins to copper. And what does that do? It lowers the expression of copper in the body. And there's no way to turn off the adrenaline to stop the buildup of iron in the spleen that makes us more vulnerable to illness. It's like, there's a wow factor to that, I think. Mm -hmm. So the iron is caught, too much iron is causing iron toxicity. I'm just laying this out in layman's terms just to make sure I've got it. Yeah. Too much iron is causing iron toxicity. It is affecting the liver. It is affecting the spleen. It is affecting the immune system. Absolutely. And we are getting that through even the iron that we're exposed to, even without iron supplements. Yes. And then the um, and copper is regulating that. So without enough copper, we're not, the body isn't able to regulate is it the um, the recycling or the, um... it, the? It's a wonderful question, Lauren. It's multifactorial. If if the copper is not available to regulate iron and oxygen, we're not going to create energy. 
if the copper is not available to clear the oxidative stress. There's just like when, when we drive a car, there's always exhaust coming out the back. But when it gets out of regulation, the, the exhaust builds, it gets it gets darker. And when it's black, billowy smoke, right? We know we got a problem. We got to take the car in. Well, the black billowing smoke that comes out of our, our mitochondria is called uric acid. Nobody, nobody knows about your, oh, they don't, they think it's just, it's just uh, gout. I, in fact, I heard in, in a waiting room the other day, I heard someone say, yeah, I had a bout of, a bout of gout. And I thought, oh my gosh, gout, if, if, if uric acid expression is Mount Everest, gout is the top foot of Mount Everest. Not, uric acid is a very toxic chemical that needs to be neutralized. And, and guess who neutralizes it? Of course. Papa. Of course. So if we're not able to neutralize that, if we can't express copper to keep our connective tissue in proper regulation, we're going to get um, hernias. We're going to get all sorts of uh, problems, holes in our, our blood vessels and in our tissue. If we, if we don't have copper, we're not going to have proper colorization of our tissue. Our, our organs need to be a color. They're, they're not white. They're supposed to have a deep red or purple color. And that requires an enzyme called melanin or protein, excuse me, a protein called melanin, which requires an enzyme called tyrosinase. Well, if tyrosinase is not available, and, the, and what does tyrosinase run on? Copper. And, and what's one of the most significant food additives in food processing? Tyrosinase inhibitors. Because food processors are more worried about shelf life than human life. And so on so many different levels, we don't realize the connections that bioavailable copper have to our health and well-being. And so when cop copper gets suppressed by too much iron, then we lose our capacity to express ourselves. We lose our natural intelligence. And there really is an internal intelligence. And I think that people have been um, misinformed. And it, we'll, just, we'll just leave it that they've been misinformed. And that we have been misled into thinking that we need more iron and we need less copper when, in fact, I flipped it around in the root cause protocol and said, let's focus on the opposite and see how we do. And people find that they do quite well because they're able to make more energy. They're able to regulate their oxidative stress. They're able to respond to stress in a much more resilient way. So that that's a great kind of segue into if you can talk us through, because obviously we're talking about the problem. I always like to bring, and, and it's good because people need to know what the problem is. I also like to bring the solution. So if the average person, I say the average person, most people listening to this podcast have some uh, knowledge of holistic healing um, and like to follow that sort of approach. Um, for anyone listening here who has been told that they are anemic or iron deficient, right. what would be the first thing that they should do? For, with what I know, the first thing they should do is get a better blood test. <laughs> no, and that's, that's quite hard in the UK. So um, and I always like to preface that when I speak to anyone right. in the US, because we have the National Health Service, right. which is always your quote marks, you know, free. Uh, we pay for it with our health, uh, and with our taxes and with many other right. things. Right. Um, and, um, you know, if, in emergency care, it's great that it's free and it's great that it's there. But other than emergency care, um, you can imagine how a free service, you right. know, suffers. And um, what this means is that what people are given is what they get. And, uh, mo right. you know, the majority of people say I can't afford private health care. So they don't go and do these very expensive blood tests. Right. But I'm guessing that the root cause protocol is the thing that kind of balances all the minerals. Therefore, so when we get enough copper and we do it in the right way and we've got enough magnesium, we're balancing all the minerals. Is that able to balance out the iron? Are we going to deal with our iron toxicity levels and have the right sort of iron running through our body? It kind of or is it that we need the the copper and it's actually that we don't need to worry about the iron at all right 
Great, great question. Um, absent the, the testing, and I t- well understand that conflict, and, and it's other parts of the world as well. Canada. We can get it done through functional medicine doctors and that kind of thing, but it's not I think- easy. It's not cheap. It's not cheap at all. And I know it's not cheap in the States either, I guess, because you guys pay monthly for your um, healthcare. Maybe it comes under that. I don't know. Either way, most people here and prices have gone up and people are struggling at the moment. So um, yes, if people can get to a functional medicine doctor who does these amazing tests, let's start with, you know, what is the test you recommend? And then let's go on to kind of the answer. So let me take advantage of the, of the, um, poster behind you that has joy, ease, and surrender. (sighs) Let me reverse the order. If people can surrender to the fact that there's more to the story about copper and iron, that will bring them greater ease in their understanding of how the body works. And if they can act on that greater ease, that will lead to greater energy, which will bring them greater joy. So, the protocol, the, what really drove the creation of the protocol was an article I read by Ray Pete, who's a famous um, scientist here in the States, specialized in um, hormones, estrogen in particular. And he wrote a very important article. I don't even remember what year it was, but it was an article about iron overload. And I was very moved by it. And in the closing paragraphs of that article, he made a very important observation. He said, to my knowledge, no one has ever developed a recipe to increase the production of the copper protein ceruloplasmin. And Lauren, when I read that, it's like a lightning bolt struck me. And I went, that's what I'm going to (laughs) do. Because I knew how important that protein, it's the master antioxidant protein in our body. Glutathione is the master antioxidant in our cell. Melatonin is the master antioxidant in the mitochondria. They're all three very important, and they all three require bioavailable copper. But the ceruloplasmin is a complete mystery to most doctors, and no, no member of the public has ever even heard of it. But it's the it's the uh, protein that really allows us to have ease and joy on this planet because it has this mysterious ability to regulate cop, excuse me, regulate oxygen and iron at the same time. And it has multifunctional capacity. And so if people can surrender to that truth, that that is in fact, the the cornerstone of our metabolism, they can start to do the stops and the starts of the root cause protocol. And people do it all the time. When I started this movement, uh, there were like two people and a dog uh, in the magnesium advocacy group. And now there's a quarter of a million people. Uh, I don't know how many dogs there are, but, (laughs) but there are a lot of people. And I get messages from people every week from around the world. I don't know who they are thanking me for saving their life, thanking me for giving them uh, a new understanding about how the body works and simply uh, changing the the stop or changing the routine that many people are under and starting to adopt the stops and then starting to incorporate the phases of the root cause protocol. It's very straightforward, but it takes time and it takes discipline, takes some level of patience and persistence But what people find is they start to feel better. I've had people feel better within three days. Typically, it takes about three months. I've had some people take three months or or, um, like nine months. So something it really depends on where the the person is. And the most important variable, Lauren, is to what extent does the individual believe in their body's natural ability, the innate healer, to what extent do they believe in their body's natural ability to heal itself when given the right nutrients? Mm-hmm. And the, the catch in our lifestyle is we didn't know that they were giving us the wrong nutrients. And so there are very simple and powerful steps that people can take, like as you've alluded to, 
stop taking iron, stop taking calcium, stop taking vitamin D. I know that's heretical to even say, but start taking cod liver oil, which has both vitamin A and D in it. You know, people don't realize the impact that, say, ascorbic acid has versus whole food vitamin C. They're mm-hmm. very different molecules. And that's uh, addressed pretty extensively in my book, The uh, Cure Your Fatigue. And so people need to know that there is knowledge out there that isn't part of the mainstream narrative, but it's documented extensively in the scientific literature. And by some quirk of fate, I just happened to have had the gumption to read 10,000 research articles. And some for, by some grace of God, I can keep track of it in my cranium and write about it and talk about it and inspire people to take the steps that they need to take to mm. feel better and to to bring that ease and bring that joy into their lives. And at first, it's almost it's too simple. And, and as people get into it, they realize just how important these changes are and just how much uh, they benefit by reversing the narrative. And I think we've all learned um, in the last few years that the narrative has been horribly skewed against us. And what this protocol does is help you to untangle that knot. Mm. Um, can can we just rewind for a second? And can you let us know what that blood test is? If people are going to go and do a blood test, what sure. are they looking for? Right. Uh, here in the States, it's called the, the Full Monty Iron Panel. And so people can Google that. And what, what will pop up is a company called Request a Test. Again, it's a U.S.-based uh, system. And there's some other vendors that have it as well. But but Request a Test is probably the most prevalent. And they can see there's a listing of all the different tests that are included. And what we focus on is not just the iron markers. We're also addressing zinc and copper and that protein ceruloplasmin, magnesium inside the red blood cell. We're looking at um, vitamin A and vitamin D because we need to have those in, in balance. And we're also looking at uric acid. So it's 13 different markers that we're looking at now and with just those 13 markers, I I and the people that I've trained, about a thousand people now, uh, can very quickly size up the, the dynamic that the person's facing, the stress that they're facing, not just the emotional stress, the metabolic stress inside their body, and can begin to address uh, actions that can be taken to lower their emotional stress, bring more ease and joy into their lives, and what people don't realize is that when we are stressed out, and who isn't stressed out these days, but when we are stressed out, <clears throat> what the, the emotion that's really driving it or being at that point is called fear. And I spell it a little differently. It's F-E hyphen A-R. And then the word becomes iron activates rust. And so when we're in a state of fear, we become a magnet for iron. That's important for people to know. And so we have recommendations to lower that stress using emotional release techniques. And then what the blood test reveals is where are the imbalances in uh, these critical blood markers that tell us how well copper is able to express itself in relationship to zinc, in relationship to iron, in relationship to magnesium. And the uh, marker around uric acid tells us to what extent is exhaust building in the system. That's a very, very powerful way to look at it. Is the test definitive? Absolutely not. Is it directionally correct? Absolutely is. And it gives people a window into how sensitive their body and blood markers are to the stress of their world, creating oxidative stress in their body, and it will show up in the in the blood testing. If you've been here a while, you'll know that I believe that we should get whatever we can in the way of nutrition through food. And where we can't get it through food, that's where we supplement. Now, in order to get myself from disabled to completely able-bodied, 
I had to be really specific and well-researched when it came to supplements, which is why I've been using Amrita Nutrition for the past decade, more than decade actually, to buy pretty much 95% of the supplements I take and recommend. Now Amrita stock the highest quality brands using the highest quality non-synthetic ingredients. Most of these brands couldn't even be bought in the UK when I started taking them years ago, so Amrita have made it super easy and accessible. And the other great thing about Amrita is they offer personal support. So if you're not sure of which supplement to order, you can call them and they'll advise you. Now, they're usually a practitioner-only stockist, but you can buy supplements from Amrita now using practitioner invite code Lauren, which will get you 10% off all supplements. And once you set up an account, that 10% will be applied to every order. I've gone ahead and created a collection of all my favorite supplements with Amrita to help you out with it, which you can find in the show notes or on my website by typing in Amrita. Otherwise, just visit amritanutrition.co.uk and use code Lauren for 10% off. Thank you so much to Amrita for continuing to support our mission here at Reconditioned. Wow, okay. So can you give us the fundamentals of the root cause protocol or I know I know it's quite like you say it's simple it's also a little bit complex because it can there's certain things that you have to add along the way what are the fundamentals though well the the fundamentals again we start with stops that's very unique stop doing this and we take people through a dozen different nutrients that you you don't want supplemental iron you don't want supplemental uh, calcium you don't want ascorbic acid. You want a different form of, of whole food vitamin C. Can you just can we just go on to that for just a second? Because there will sure. be people hearing this thinking, what do you mean I shouldn't take calcium or vitamin D? You know, this is what I've been told for, especially since COVID, you know. So right. what does that, can you explain to people then what that means for them? And, and, and so the protocol basically balances that all out but it's a case of you just stop all those things if you are taking them well it, it, it's important for people to know that that even though there's more calcium in our body it's regulated by magnesium mm. all, all of the the uh, calcium hormones calcitonin parathyroid hormone and vitamin d it's actually a hormone it's hormone d those hormones are regulated by magnesium status in in a corresponding fashion, there's way more iron than copper. And every facet of iron metabolism is copper dependent. And so people need to know that. And so if they if they begin to understand those basics, that's a really critical step for them to understand that. So I've been told to take calcium. And typically I've been told to take calcium because I have osteoporosis or osteopenia. Well, what people have not been told is what causes calcium loss in the bone. There's a, something called the bone matrix, and it, it, it involves the fusion of, of um, a, a, about a dozen different minerals, but but obviously the um, the structure of the bone itself. And when a certain enzyme is present or activated, it causes calcium loss causes the bone matrix to break down and calcium gets released. Well, that enzyme is called acid phosphatase. And guess what? It's activated by iron. And its antagonist is called alkaline phosphatase. And alkaline phosphatase is activated by magnesium. Ding, ding, ding. And so here we have this inherent tension between magnesium and iron playing out in the bone matrix. And in order to stop the calcium loss, you've got to bring iron under regulation. And when you get iron under regulation, you can start to support more magnesium in the body. And then the magnesium can, can begin to stimulate the creation and the expansion of the bone matrix. But then there's two critical enzymes that are needed to solidify all that. One is called ascorbate oxidase, which prevents the loss of minerals in the bone matrix. And the second is called lysyl oxidase. And, and so we have uh, collagen, gives us strength, 
and we have elastin that gives us flexibility. Well, those two proteins need to be knit together in order to have proper integrity in our bone matrix. Well, that lysyl oxidase is what knits collagen and elastin together. And both lysyl oxidase and ascorbate oxidase are copper dependent. And that's in the literature. You have to dig deep to find it. It's not talked about on the internet. It's not talked about in your doctor's office because they're drones for their training. And so people need to get beyond the superficial narrative and realize that there's more to the story. And they need to surrender their belief in the narrative and be more curious. Mm -hmm. And how do we spell curious? C-U hyphen R-I-O-U-S. So we see that symbol for copper again. And be more curious about copper. What else is it doing? And so people are following directives that are that are being given by well-intentioned practitioners who do not have complete understanding or education about how the body works. They're, they're wonderful people. They're very uh, well-intentioned. They have high integrity. But I think they need to be more curious about why am I... Why do I keep telling people to do the same thing, same thing, same thing, but they're not getting better? Mm -hmm. And they're not challenging the narrative. They're not challenging their training. And I think that's really where the, the public comes to, to the uh, significant role of helping to question the narrative, helping to raise this level of, well, maybe there is more to the story. And so the, the whole basis of vitamin D supplementation is based on thousands of studies that tell us that vitamin D regulates our immune system. Well, there's more to the story. It turns out it isn't the storage D that we've been told to supplement with. That's actually an inactive form of hormone D. There's an active form of hormone D. And that active form requires an enzyme it's called 125 hydroxylase. But it also requires another enzyme called the PAM enzyme that we talked about a long time ago. Well, those, those are two really important enzymes. 125 hydroxylase requires magnesium, PAM requires copper, as we said. And if it and if it is not active hormone D, and if that form of, of hormone D does not have connection to the VDR, the vitamin D receptor which is magnesium dependent. And those two are not connected to what's called a nuclear receptor called RXR. That stands for retinoid X receptor. Well, you can't make RXR without vitamin A. And if you're focused just on vitamin D intake, you're going to block the uptake of vitamin A. Mm. And people don't know that. They've not been schooled in the fact that there's more to the story. And so the, the part of uh, the vitamin D dynamic that, that regulates our immune system, it's actually three parts that need to work together. And that triad is what helps to regulate the immune system. And that is not openly discussed on the internet. Again, it's well documented in the literature that most people don't know about. And most practitioners don't know about. And that's fine. That's just where we are. And so people need to know that the, the information is there. I've been dabbling in it. Not, and I'm not the only one. There are other practitioners. But I've, I think I've brought together a unique uh, distillation of this research to create this protocol so people can uh, accelerate their ad adoption of changes in their diet changes in their supplement routine to optimize energy production so they have more ease and joy in their lives. And that's really what it comes down to. And it, but 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 the, I'm so glad you have that poster there, uh, Lauren. But what it requires, what this whole process requires is the willingness to surrender to two things. One, there's more to the story. And two, my body, my physiology has wisdom way beyond what I thought it had, but it needs to be energized 
by the right nutrients. And there really is a blueprint that runs our body, runs our what's called the immunometabolism system, because energy production and immune function are tied together. And that blueprint requires energy. And the whole paradigm of healing outside of the RCP is based on attacking the guest, not strengthening the host. And the whole paradigm is about focusing on the enemies and not the energy. And so the phrase that, that we use within the RCP is ignore the enemies, ignite the energy. And when you have energy in your body, you have optimal expression in your body and it takes care of the pathogens. They can't live in a high energy environment. So it's just a, it's a completely different way of thinking about how the body stays in balance and the example that I typically use is if you've ever been on a boogie board, like if you want to go skiing, you've got that ball in the center and you're trying to stay balanced. And that takes a lot of energy to stay balanced. If you go this way or this way, it doesn't take any energy. You've, you've, the board is on the, on the ground. The board is on the ground. But when it's here, it takes a lot of energy. And that's the way our body works. It needs energy to stay in homeostasis to stay in balance. And that's really what the whole driver is in the uh, root cause protocol. And, excuse me, you mentioned that really pathogens can't live from that place. Does that mean, do you think that, or do you believe that um, the root, root cause protocol can be, I guess, an elixir, a tonic for most um ailments most ill health i know a lot of people have been helped with thyroid problems from it autoimmune conditions right um what, what i'm discovering again as i begin to focus more and more on the mysterious organ called the spleen uh, that seems to be the focal point for all of these autoimmune conditions and the focal point for confusion around iron status that what happens is the spleen uh, Back up a step. There's a famous um, physiologist, uh, Hans Selye, who, or endocrinologist, actually, because he was an endocrinologist. Um, he studied um, animals under stress. He did he did thirty thousand experiments with animals to see how they respond to stress. And what he noticed was that an organ expands under stress and then collapses. And this is true of the spleen too. The spleen goes into a hyper state and then it goes into a hypo low functioning state. And that low functioning state affects a lot of things, not the least of which is iron recycling and the immune system. And so I think what the, the protocol has been doing unwittingly, I didn't, didn't have as much focus on the spleen, is it's helping to restore optimal function to that part of our body. Uh, and it's we couple that knowledge with the importance of uh, phlebotomies, that people should be engaged in regular uh, bloodletting. Um, for men and postmenopausal women, it would be quarterly. Women who are still cycling, have, still have a menstrual cycle, probably need to do it at least twice a year. But there are many women doing the RCP who are menstruating and still do it four times a year. And, and feel very energized by it. So people need to know that, that there are steps that can be taken. What we're also learning now is that fasting, fasting has a unique ability to activate something called autophagy. And what does autophagy do? It helps to get rid of excess iron. And we're just beginning to understand the autophagy iron uh, release connection. And so there are some very simple things we can do to begin to lower the iron footprint and increase the copper footprint to allow for more uh, expression and energy in our body. And so the um, what I'm coming to realize, much to my surprise, is how critical this mysterious organ, the spleen is, in the um, being the, the site of, of the the beginning of so many conditions, whether they are um, pathogenic 
or um, immune def uh, autoimmune deficiencies and things like that. I I'm absolutely humbled by what I'm learning about the, the known understanding about how the spleen can influence these conditions. Uh, the other side of it is the liver, of course, and there's a very close inner communication between the liver and the spleen. And what I'm very mindful of is that about 40% of people over 60 around the world are dealing with metabolic syndrome. Well, that's an enormous number. That's like 3 billion people. 40%. And, and the, the four highs of metabolic syndrome are hypertension, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol and high triglycerides. And the fourth is hyperuricemia, high uric acid. So we have high blood pressure, high blood sugar, high cholesterol, and high uric acid. And what do they create? High insulin in the blood. And what's fascinating is to find out that it takes twice as much insulin this is based on a, a book that was written by Robert Lustig in 2013. But in 2013, it took twice as much insulin to clear the same unit of glucose 30 years previously. So early 80s versus 2013 required twice as much insulin. And, and what is that telling us? Is we're getting weaker as a species. And what is it that's critical to clear blood sugar from our body? It's copper. Copper plays a critical role in uh, managing not just iron, not just oxygen, but blood sugar, which is a major oxidant in our diet. And so, you know, that, that might be the, the basis of another conversation for us. But when you think about the impact of autoimmune and metabolic syndrome, we're talking about a huge um, stratification of illness that people are struggling with that is correctable with, with real adoption and discipline around uh, the nutrient focus of the root cause protocol. That's a pretty, that's a, a very powerful idea that hopefully will inspire people that their uh, well-being is well within their grasp, but it's going to require them to think differently about their condition and maybe sur surrender to this um, state this this label that's been uh, tattooed to their forehead. You are diabetic. You have heart disease. You have mm. hypertension. You have Lyme disease. You have whatever. That that declaration is incredibly disempowering. Because what's yeah. the first people do is they run to the internet to say Lyme disease. Yeah, those are my symptoms. I've got Lyme disease. Not knowing that Lyme disease is supposed to be cleared in a spleen that has proper functioning and energy and iron clearing capability. And if it doesn't have those conditions, then the pathogenic expression uh, begins to take over. And the parasites are very powerful, as you well know. And if they're not being cleared in the spleen, they're going to take, take over in other parts of the body. And that's an important thing to understand is that our body was beautifully designed by our maker and mother nature. But what's changed? Our farming system has changed. Mm. Our food processing system has changed. The pharmaceuticals have changed over the course of our lifetime and over certainly over the course of the last century. And we are in a very different environment today in 2023 than we were at the, the beginning of the First World War. The world is, is right? radically different. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, is it right to say, and I don't want to really get into the politics of it now, but that the farm, so many of the pharmaceuticals that people are taking in themselves are depleting us of these minerals that we need? There's there's enough evidence that I've seen that I suspect that um, there's a lot more to the story. Yeah. That, um, uh, what's the, the really popular um, medication for diabetes, metformin? Yeah. It's a known copper chelator. Yeah. And the and the argument is, oh, well, it's that unbound copper that's causing. Can you problem. explain to people what chelating means? Chelate. So chelation is is based on a Greek word meaning claw. So it grabs a, a mineral. Uh, unfortunately, chelation can be 
uh, double entendre can have two meanings. Uh, it can be the claw and the capturing of the mineral can be to our benefit, or it can be to our uh, detriment because it's being removed from our our uh, biology. More often than not, it's the it's the negative form of chelation that's affecting us, and there are um, many studies that begin to look at the mineral loss. And in fact, um, Mildred Seeley that I mentioned, she was a physician um, back, she got her medical degree, I think in the 1960s, um, early 60s. She went into drug research. And very early on, she realized that a lot of the medications that she was studying were causing magnesium loss. And because of that, she resigned her position and devoted the next 50 years of her life to teach people about the importance of magnesium, how to replace it, and how to make sure that you're not losing it. So do I have um, documented proof that it's all? No, but there's enough smoking guns in luminaries like uh, Mildred Seeley, uh, uh, Leslie Clavet, who's a copper expert, and many others like them who have called to question that there's more to the story, uh, mm. particularly as it relates to that whole pharmaceutical scene in our in our lifestyle. So, can we go through a few of the stops and starts? And one of my questions, one of my most important questions, is: Are we meant to be taking copper as a supplement, or do we get it from somewhere else? And um, also to go through the types of magnesium, because I know there are many types, and we all need different types depending on what we're going through. Yeah. So um, our ancestors had the benefit of a very nutrient-dense diet. The soils were very replete with minerals, had, had plenty of minerals in them. Uh, and sources of copper would have been in the organ meats that they would have had, in the shellfish that they were eating, in nuts and seeds. Um, the, the tragedy that we're faced with today, Lauren, is that um, copper is not as prevalent as it used to be. Um, the, the, the cold hard facts are that uh, farming chemicals are very hard on copper status, not the least of which is glyphosate, Roundup that people may have heard of. And uh, glyphosate is known, known to be a mineral chelator, again, claw, but it's taking the minerals out of uh, action in the soil. But, but not all minerals are coming out at equal speed. And so glyphosate takes out copper a billion times faster than it takes out magnesium. It takes out copper a thousand times faster than it takes out zinc. Well, those, those are important statistics to know. And that's the work of, of Don Huber at um, Purdue University here in the States, it was a study he did it's actually a textbook that he, he wrote in uh, December of last year. So the average person doesn't know about that. The average practitioner doesn't know about that. And so um, the loss of copper is significant. Um, copper is, as I've noted earlier, uh, under acute stress, we lose magnesium. It's just the way our biology is designed. But under chronic stress, what happens is the body increases the production of a protein called metallothionine. And, metalloth and, and it's a four to five fold increase of metallothionine under chronic stress. When you think, uh, go back to 2020 and think about how you felt in 2020. And that chronic stress is binding up copper, that metallothionine protein is binding up copper a thousand times stronger than it's binding up zinc. Now, the problem we have is that big numbers make us uncomfortable, and then we just tend to reject them. You probably know someone who's twice as strong as you, maybe someone who's three times as strong as you, but you've never met anyone who's a thousand times stronger. Okay? You can't even comprehend that. It's, it's so overwhelming. You just say, I'm just going to put that aside. It's too much. And I, I can't deal with that. But that's what we're faced with now is chemicals in our environment that are changing our physiology. And so in the early uh, 
years of the root cause protocol, yes, we were very much focused on getting people to get their copper through their diet. And then I think what happened was the last couple of years got us to realize, oh, this is a very different world now. And I back actually renamed what COVID stands for. Uh, the COV stands for coppers vanished. And the ID stands for irons dysregulated. And the research that people are not used to or not aware of is that since 1928, in two separate studies, March and May of 1928, um, they proved that animals that were given a copper deficient diet had iron accumulation in their body, especially in their liver and in their spleen. And so when copper is being bound up a thousand times stronger than zinc, then iron is building in our body. And that's what motivated me to develop a, a copper supplement called Recuperate. And it's readily available on Activate FIQ. You can look for Recuperate. And it's a wonderful blend of desiccated beef liver and spirulina and some turmeric and then two milligrams of copper bisglycinate, which is a very bioavailable form of copper. Um, you know, the early days of the, of the protocol, we didn't realize how compromised copper was. Now we're much more mindful of it. So I think it's an important piece of the puzzle that we are actively trying to get people to understand how important copper supplementation is. Um, as it relates to the magnesium, um, <clears throat> there's really four different kinds of magnesium. Um, we're supposed to get magnesium in our food. You know, anything that's green is supposed to have magnesium. Uh, I was a little humbled and uh, dismayed when I learned that broccoli is turned green in factory settings when they spray it with nitric oxide, which then calls to question, where's the magnesium in that? And so um, historically, anything green was influenced by chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is, um, it works because it has magnesium in the center. Um, then maybe that's not so true anymore. And so, again, what's also different is the amount of magnesium loss that we have in our biology because of the stressful environment that we live in. And so magnesium in food is, is one category. Second category would be magnesium in water. It turns out that the most magnesium-rich water in the world is in Poland. Mm -hmm. So if you have a Polish market nearby, go down and get some of their magnesium rich water. It's, it's amazing. And what it typically will also have is a lot of bicarbonate, which is also very helpful for our, our well-being as well. And so um, you can make magnesium rich water using bicarbonate and milk of magnesia. And there's formulas for that on the uh, magnesium advocacy group. And then a third form is called transdermal. And so those the two most prevalent uh, forms of it would be Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate, uh, named after, I think it's the River Epsom in England. I think it's actually where it was first discovered. Um, I think it was a dairy farmer who discovered that his cows were producing more milk because they were drinking from the River Epsom. And they backed in to find out why, why that was the case. I hope that's a true story. I, I don't know that I don't know the uh, the documentation of it, but that that seems to be the wives' tale. But uh, magnesium sulfate and magnesium chloride oil are two very uh, popular forms of transdermal uh, magnesium, and you don't ever want to do them both at the same time. Um, magnesium sulfate is more of a detox. Magnesium chloride oil, it's not really an oil. It just feels kind of slimy. Uh, it's actually dehydrated seawater. So it has kind of a filmy uh, texture to it. And that helps to restore magnesium status. And so transdermal is amazing. And, and a lot of people who are notably uh, suffering from being a stress cadet find that the transdermal is more um, accepted by their body because if you start just you know pounding magnesium, it's going to put a lot of stress on the adrenals. Mm -hmm. 
because magnesium is going to drive down sodium. And a lot of people who have adrenal fatigue have very weak sodium to begin with. So the, the transdermal seems to be a better way in helping give people uh, what we call the adrenal cocktails, gets them to start to restore their adrenal function, get exposure to a broader base of, of minerals. And then the fourth category that I think you were really alluding to in your question was um, the supplemental forms of magnesium. And there's about 25 different forms. Um, the two, at least as I've studied the literature, the two most um, absorbable forms are magnesium malate and magnesium glycinate. They're, they're very well documented in studies by like Albion Minerals and other manufacturers for, for their uh, bioavailability, their absorption. Uh, but there are many others. There's uh, a very popular form is magnesium orotate. That's very popular in Europe. Magnesium gluconate. Um, a lot of people are very enamored with magnesium three and eight. Uh, that, that's kind of, a, a, as far as I'm aware, a good one for... Um if you're suffering with anxiety, depression, neurological, anything neurological, is that right? Yes. Whereas glycinate and malate are kind of the stand, the kind of gold standard muscle sleep or that kind of stuff. And what is the difference between glycinate and bisglycinate? Um, one, that, that that's a great question. I think that I know the bisglycinate is two glycine. The magnesium glycinate, um, as far as I know, I don't know why they wouldn't always say bisglycinate, but they don't. So but I would some assume, do. But some do. Some do, and I always wonder what's the difference. Well, if it's glycinate, it's only one glycine. And whether there's something else there or not, I don't know. But the fact that the um, bisglycinate means there's two glycine, and that's that's the key difference. As it as it relates to the issue that you just raised a minute ago about anxiety. Um, one of the things I've learned over the last 15 years is that any condition, malady, syndrome, that begins with the word A, like anxiety or acne or anemia or whatever, um, all of those conditions respond well to vitamin A supplementation. Mm. So what does vitamin A do? It helps to make copper bioavailable because retinol is the catalyst to make the copper pumps work so they can populate the copper enzymes with copper. And what does copper, what does bioavailable copper do? It helps to regulate the iron that's causing the oxidative stress that's causing the anxiety. And so anxiety does not come from Mars. It comes from a copper deficient, magnesium deficient, iron toxic body mm -hmm. that has lost its regulation of its neurotransmitters. And what is also completely missing is the signaling between the neurotransmitters because the PAM enzyme is not expressing properly because the PAM enzyme requires copper. So would you say that children with ADHD require a lot of mineral balance, more copper, more magnesium? Absolutely, but they also need a lot less iron. Yeah. I would argue that... And fortified uh, foods, right? That makes a massive difference. Not better, eating them. <laughs> yeah, but to better understand ADHD, <clears throat> I would encourage people to Google um, autism, oxidative stress, I think what they'll find is that <clears throat> it's a massive, <clears throat> excuse me, uptick in oxidative stress caused by iron dysregulation. And there is magnesium loss to that, but there's also a lack of copper regulation. And that's contributing mightily to the inability to activate the oxygen to make the energy. And when, it, when the body can't do that in the mitochondria, it's going to create oxidants that are going to affect the neurotransmitters and the hormones, all of whom are designed to respond to the state of oxygen in the body. And 
would you say that it's also a vicious cycle in terms of it's causing us to feel more anxiety and more depression and all these symptoms, but also, you know, I do a lot of work with the nervous system and our nervous systems are so dysregulated and we're so overwhelmed and we've got too much information coming our way. There's too much doing. And that in itself is probably affecting the balance of minerals. I I would imagine. Oh, uh, no, no question about it. And People theorize that we were designed as a species to be 90% of the time we should be in a parasympathetic mode, yeah, chilling, easing, having joy. Yeah. And actually it's been flipped. Right. Now we spend about 90% of our time in a hypersympathetic state, yeah. running from the bear. And either it's a real bear or a perceived bear. And that that alone causes mineral loss. But then we um, begin to engage in poor eating habits. We engage in the wrong kind of supplements. We engage in the, in pharmaceuticals that are designed um, with good intention, but they are, are secondary consequences. And so there is this massive dysregulation of the minerals. And the average person doesn't know that. They don't want to know that. They just want to feel better. Yeah. And And really, to feel better... You got to make more energy. That's the bottom line. And people need to know that. Think think about it in a broader context. There was a time when oxygen was not on this planet. And then a long time ago, oxygen began to be produced on this planet and went into what's called the primordial sea and then eventually as it built in the sea, it began to go into the atmosphere. And the air we breathe today is 21% oxygen, O2 molecule. Two, two, two atoms of oxygen make one molecule of oxygen. And so 21% of the air we breathe is oxygen. But when it was one-tenth of one percent, one-tenth of one percent, it triggered what's called the great oxygen event, sometimes called the great oxidation event, many, many years ago. And it wiped out 99% of life on the planet because life was all anaerobic. It wasn't using oxygen. And boom, in a flash, all this life changed. And what saved us, what saved life on this planet, what allowed higher order life and species to evolve was the ability to make more energy at the direction of bioavailable copper. And it's the the uh, the biologists that, that, that get into this evolutionary side of it are fascinating to, to read because of their understanding about how early life evolved. But think about the primal source of anxiety is cells and their tissue being exposed to the oxygen molecule and not knowing what to do with it, not being able to activate it, not being able to clear it. And those are the responsibilities of bioavailable copper. And when we are low in copper because of uh, the foods that we're eating, because of some of the additives that are in our lives, the body becomes increasingly exposed to oxygen that it cannot dispose of, triggers the neurochemistry that you're talking about. It's just very reactive. We got a problem in Houston and we become very anxious because of that. And the body is ideally designed to be able to neutralize all that when the chemistry that's directed by copper is allowed to express itself. So it's it's just, you know, again, we're back to more, there's more to the story that, mm. that has not been um, fully elaborated uh, in social circles, in clinical circles. And that's what the, the whole root cause protocol is all about, trying to expand that awareness. So I got all my information for the root cause protocol from the Magnesium Advocacy Group. Is there a better place to get it all in one place and know all the stops and all the starts and all the protocol, like everything you have to do? There's a there's a uh, an amazing amount of information 
on social media, the Magnesium Advocacy Group and the Root Cause Protocol page. Uh, if, you, if you're looking for a, a more condensed form, you can get the, bo- the book, Cure Your Fatigue. If you want to focus on the handbook, there is um, a 50-page document that you can download for free. It gives you all of kind of the, the, the hows and whys and what's the rationale. And then if you're looking for a, a really cryptic form, you can go to, again, Activate FIQ, and there's a, uh, an abridged form of the, of the handout. And you can even just Google uh, RCP stops and starts, and there are little charts that are just, are just the stops and the starts. You know, depending upon what level of detail, uh, there are many different forms. And then there are, oh my gosh, there are hundreds of, of conversations that I've had with folks like yourself over the years to explain these uh, nuances. And there's one more source. Uh, it's called the RCP 101 video. And it's it's a... Um, I think it's four hours long. You have to pay for it. It's like a hundred bucks. And, um, but it, it's me having a very relaxed, um, easy conversation with Ben Edwards, who's a physician here in the States, talking about the rationale, the RCP, why, why the stops, why the starts. And people might find that to be a very um, useful place. So we have a spectrum of sources depending upon uh, the extent to which someone wants to dig in or get started, uh, there's a, there's a whole range of options that people have to learn how to uh, begin to incorporate this into their lifestyle. There's just one thing I, I kind of want to go back to, or, or we haven't really touched much on, because a large portion of my listeners are mums, uh, mothers, um, or parents generally, and women in pregnancy are often told to take iron because they're iron deficient, mm-hmm. um, or after they've had a baby, or when they're menstruating because they're low in iron. So it's just worth um, kind of giving them a, a, um, a bit of recognition, I guess, that there are other ways around this. And, and, and is the root cause protocol um, completely safe during pregnancy and um, when you are heading towards conception? Uh, absolutely. Um Animal farmers know that if their animals are not producing offspring, there's only one mineral they add to their feed. It's called copper. That's a shocker. Copper. Copper. I sa- and I said shocker. Shocker. Okay. <laughs> I thought you said sugar. Okay. Yeah, shocker. And um, there are many, many thousands. I don't know how many there are. A lot of people uh, are relying on the, the root cause protocol to support their pregnancy. There are probably scores, I'll I'll be conservative, there are scores of children who exist today because of the root cause protocol. They're called RCP babies, couples that couldn't have children that suddenly had a child, mm-hmm. couples that uh, had been trying to have another child, and because the either the mom or the dad or both were low in copper, back to the animal farmer, um, they found bingo bongo, they were able to have children. And so... Um, that's Mother Nature at her finest. We we were never meant to be struggling with our well being like we are in the modern era. Yeah. They, they have stripped all of the ease out of our lives, and they've made everything a stressful event. And that that is unprecedented prior to about a century ago. Yeah. Our, our ancestors. I, assuming that they're in touch with what's going on today, are rolling in their graves wondering what happened because they didn't have this level of dis-ease um, on the planet or in their lives. Mm-hmm. And our ancestors did not have a doctor for every body part. It's just, it's an unprecedented time of abuse as far as I'm concerned, where we we struggle to find real food where we struggle to find um, real um, ease with making energy in our body and being able to express ourselves easily, and it's just, um, I think it's, I think it's time for a change, and that's really what the RCP is meant to be as a, if you would, a movement to get people to realize that there's a whole uh, natural paradigm of energy uh, production as well as lifestyle they can allow us to stay in balance and it's a, it's just important for people to realize that there is 
way more to the story than you've been trained to believe. I completely agree. One last thing that's just come to mind. Um, when my friends and I were talking about um, those of us, some of us have kids who struggle more with kind of, um, you know, they're more sensory and they have more gut issues and stuff like that. And we want to give them more magnesium. The only magnesium we can find that is um, kind of other than transdermal, I actually use transdermal sprays for my kids mostly, and I do it on them every other night. But if we wanted to increase that and say, put some magnesium in a smoothie, or give them a supplement. The only kids magnesium I can find is citrate. And in my research, I, I, I mean, you, you maybe correct me if this has been updated, but magnesium citrate um, affects ser- the production of ceruloplasmin, which is going to affect copper. So right. is is that correct? Should we stay away from citrate generally for kids and us? Or and is and, and which would be the best um, form of magnesium for kids? Well. Th- as a rule, I encourage people to stay away from uh, magnesium oxide and magnesium citrate. They're, they're just not restoring magnesium status the way people think they are. Um, I think what uh, would be a benefit for children in a situation like that would be castor oil packs mm. to ease some of the iron removal from their intestine, which is where there's a lot of unrest. Um and both over their liver as well as their spleen and their uh, intestine, that, that whole center part of their body is probably riddled with iron. They're not aware of it. Their mom's not aware of it. And uh, it's a very gentle form of detox uh, using a quercetin as the active ingredient in uh, castor oil. And it's both a um, iron detox as well as a stimulant for the um, energy production. So I would really encourage people to do that. Um, transdermal is very effective, as you as you acknowledged. Um, probably the magnesium water would also be another good option. Again, go go find some Polish water. It's amazing how magnesium rich it is. What about adding trace minerals to water? Is that enough? You can do, you can do that. Again. Um, I think we live in such a minerally deprived time that we need to be really. We can do it all kind of. Yeah. We've got to do more. Yeah. I think you're going to have to experiment with the children who are sensitive and build up their tolerance. What I had a client many years ago, probably almost a decade ago who couldn't, all she could tolerate was one drop of magnesium chloride oil. And it took her six months to get to the point where she could really tolerate magnesium supplementation. Wow. That's how iron toxic she was. So it's just uh, having the staying power and the persistence to, to see it through and know that the body uh, is being um, reactive that way because it knows that there's an imbalance inside the tissue. Yeah. Um, and just very quickly to, to go back, because it occurred to me that we touched on fortified foods and it might have been confusing when we said that we didn't really um, go into it but the idea is that we stay away from fortified foods and especially for our kids because it's fortified with synthetic iron and other synthetic vitamins and obviously that's just adding to the toxic load absolutely uh, the only people getting enriched are the food manufacturers (laughs) we're we're, we're getting completed yeah so it's worth for, for people who buy kind of flowers and cereals and stuff like that looking on the box and if it, it it's funny because the food manufacturers do it as it's like a marketing ploy they're like fortified with iron and b12 for your to make your kids strong and i'm like that could not be worse <laughs> than having what, it fortified right and what people need to know i just learned this the other day what's the origin of celiac disease it's a spleen an underperforming spleen it's going to have more iron, which is going to cause signaling to affect the the ability to process the wheat. And they're not responding to gluten. No, they're responding to two things. The glyphosate is used as a desiccant, a drying agent, and it's iron fortified. I have full-blown celiac clients here in the States that can go eat the wheat in France italy and germany yeah people say they go to italy and have fresh pasta in these villages in naples or wherever and celiacs can eat pasta and they can have raw milk and the rest of it right there's no iron 
and there's no glyphosate. And what what is the iron and the glyphosate doing? It's affecting their spleen, and it's overacting the uh, response to uh, to trigger what's called celiac disease, and it's <clears throat> you know it it creates a lot of uh, stress for people when they have that condition, as you well know. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to go into rapid fire round. I think okay. we've. I think we. I mean, we could talk for ages because there is so much more. That well, we maybe could go there's, through, a, maybe there's think, a, a round two or a round three. Maybe there's definitely a round two. I think we could go deeper and like maybe niche it down a bit. Fine. And in the meantime, obviously, I just recommend people going to the Magnesium Advocacy Group, the Root, mm-hmm. Pro- Root Cause Protocol Group on Facebook, getting your book, and I'll link it all in the show notes. Right. Um, and in the meantime, and obviously, if they have any questions, they can take it all to those groups. Um, and um, but yeah, let, let let's do a round two at some point and and maybe niche it down. Okay. Um, but okay, so all about you. The first one is always the same for each guest, and that is fill in the blank. Wellness is a matter of discipline. Oh, that's very true. Uh, first step towards healing: uh, embracing and surrendering to the innate healer. Mm, I love that. Uh, a book that you read for fun. <laughs> I bet you don't read for fun. You're too busy. You're just reading. I, stuff there was a time when I did read for fun. I just, there's not a lot of fun reading now. Um, oh, a great book. Um, probably one of the the best books I've ever read. It's not. It was fun, but it was uh, the untold story of milk. If people oh. want to understand what happened to milk worldwide. Uh, it's a very important book to read. The well, story. I would find that fun. I actually laughed with my friend Kate when I told her I was interviewing you today because we've both followed your work for a long time. And she said, oh, my God, that's so exciting. I said, we're so sad. Who else would find that exciting? Like minerals, like <laughs> two hours spent talking about minerals is so exciting to us. But I love that. Funny. That's what keeps us healthy because I'm excited about stuff like that. Yeah. Um, last yeah. one. What is your favorite mineral rich meal? Uh, it would be a, a toss between um, a great uh, grass-fed, you know, organic uh, liver and onions versus a um, classically made uh, New England clam chowder. Uh, it's just loaded with goodies in there. Um, and there's a reason why our ancestors ate those types of foods. Yeah. Um, so those would be ones that I would I would tend to gravitate to. But again, yes. what what's available today and what our ancestors 200 years ago had is a little different, but we can we can get close, but we're not going to get the exact same meal. Yeah. Morley, thank you so much. As I said, this has excited me and <laughs> and right. and taught me so much more. Um and and thank you. And yeah, I'll link um, all those links, everything that Morley spoke about in the show notes for anyone who wants to go further with this, which I highly recommend you do. And yeah, let's come back for round two. That'd be great. I look forward to it. Thanks Thank again. you so much. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Reconditioned. I am honestly so grateful to each and every person that tunes in. Thank you also for taking responsibility for your own well-being. You should know that just by choosing to listen to podcasts like this that further your well-being, you're moving more deeply into abundance consciousness. Now, don't forget, I have a bunch of free resources over at laurenvacneen.co.uk, as well as every recommendation you could ever need in regards to your well-being on the LV Recommends page, all categorized for your ease. Thank you also to our sponsors. These episodes would not be possible without them, so make sure to check them out and get some pretty awesome discounts on the show notes. And of course, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast so that you can get updated each time a new one is released. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate you.